Why the Failure is sponsored by Verisurf, inspection and measurement software. Stick around after the episode to learn more. Hello, welcome to our series that asks, Why the Failure? This is our second episode in this video series. Real simple, what we're doing here, we share additive manufacturing fails on social media, ask for guesses, and then we reveal what really happened. I'm Pete Zielinski, additivemanufacturing.media. Let me introduce my partner in failure. Here's Tim Simpson, professor of additive manufacturing at Penn State University. Hi, Tim. <laughs> Hey, Pete, how you doing? To show the failure this time, I'm going to have to dismantle this part. It's on the inside. Before I do that, what is this thing? It's, uh, it's got good heft. Um, tell us about this part and the system it was 3D printed on. Sure, yeah, you should, you should feel that thing before the lattice was in there. It was the, talk about a big paperweight. So that's actually an oil and gas component. Uh, and so that goes down hole. Uh, you stack many, many, many of those up together, uh, and the internal channels in there, as you spin it, uh, centrifugal force is either pumping fluid up or pumping fluid down, depending on uh, which, way, uh, which way it's spinning. And so the goal there was to say, hey, as, as a possibility, could we look at additive for light weighting this component? Because, you know, we need the outside, we need the internal channels, but sort of the rest of that space, do with it what you want. Okay, so we got a lot of responses to this one on uh, comments on the defect we found. It's on the inside. I got to open this up to find it. You cut the part, uh, you sliced it apart in this way, actually, so we could see the failure. And here it is right here. It is this feature that was never supposed to be there, not part of the CAD model in any way. Um, as I say, we got a lot of guesses in social media as far as what went wrong here and why this, why this extra feature occurred on the inside of the part within these lattices. Um, a lot of the guesses were software related, weren't they? Absolutely, yeah. Everybody seemed to pile on to STL all of a sudden. So this was made on a, a laser powder bed fusion system. So powder particles, thin layers, laser coming down. And so typically you would take your CAD model, slice, uh, export it as an STL. We then bring it in, uh, we were using Magix at the time to, uh, to then you know, orient it and do our build prep and then print it on an EOS or M270. Uh, and so a lot of people thought somewhere in that, that conversion, particularly going from CAD to STL or when you bring STL in and uh, do an automatic repair or a check of it that uh, if one of the vertices was off, for instance, then it would realign it uh, or those sorts of things, perhaps uh, if triangles didn't align. So we heard uh, so Matthew Duffy, uh, Action Mold and Machining, uh, thought, you know, one of the perhaps one of the triangles was open and then when it automatically got fixed, uh, you know, basically it stretches it out and all of a sudden, you know, you have a plane inside the structure. Uh, Bob Markley, third dimension, similar, you know, so he'd been caught on this once or twice. Uh, uh, you know, you wouldn't catch it. You know, think about if this is only on one or two layers, right? That whole part's five inches tall. We're at a very thin layer, right? You'd have to scroll through all those slices to see if you picked it up. So Bob Markley also, um, sort of tongue in cheek, posted another theory also within, within the social media response. Can, can you read that? Because I think we're going to circle back to that one. <laughs> yeah, I love, I love this. His theory number two was, and I quote, this is so obvious. Flying squirrels got into the machine and nested in the galbos, causing them to move slow. Always blame the squirrels. They are nuts. Even I had a little uh, squirrel uh, emoji there with it as well. <laughs> All right. Put a pin in that. Um, the STL slash software answer, while very credible, was not the explanation, was it? Who were some of our respondents who, who, who landed closer to the truth? Again, it's sort of one of those things that you, it, it's sort of easy to, to, to sort of pull on that thread, right? And, and sort of go that route. But I, I enjoyed um, Sabrina Marquis, uh, one of our repeat responders uh, from Seam Research Center. She sort of went through, uh, you know, and started as, as well with the software. Hey, maybe it's an STL uh, issues when you're then repairing the triangles. And then our third uh, response here, and said, actually, due to the line marks uh, in that solid region, perhaps it was an interruption to the process. 
Maybe it stopped for some reason. Maybe the powder was out. Maybe electricity rang out. Uh, and maybe then the process had to be restarted instead of starting where it, you know, where it had stopped. Maybe it started at the lower level and then, you know, eventually the operator caught it and fixed it. Uh, and that was similar. Matthew Schomburg from uh, Tangible Solutions as well went out on a limb. I think he was among the first to really say, hey, maybe it's not a modeling issue, right? Sometimes uh, the software catches it, fixes it, and slices it. But looking at it, uh, he, he was, I think, the first to say, really, uh, you know, the operator uh, during a restart, uh, basically looking at the uh, lower layers versus where that restart was. Perhaps the machine stopped and then when it restarted, went back to layer zero instead of, uh, you know, at that particular Z height. So, Tim, um, as we're sort of hinting at here, uh, these ladder responses, they got, got it kind of right. Give us the concise story. What really happened here? How did we get this failure? Uh, it was not a software uh, modeling issue. We, we have had that occur in others, uh, but that was not the case here. And, and uh, Sabrina, Matthew, Pierre, and, and the couple others that uh, responded, it was a power issue. Uh, the power actually went out uh, on the machine. Uh, and then when the uh, operator restarted it, uh, the correct, it was restarted at layer zero. So the software, uh, you know, the build plan reset at zero as well. And so you started building layer zero there at, at you know, the Z height. And most of these parts have a, uh, a radius of curvature that mounts them to the plate to try and then, you know, reduce residual stresses. And so the zero and first layer or two is actually a little bit wider than the actual diameter of the part itself. And so if you saw the whole part uh, before it was machined, you would see that that plane extends outside of the part and then it becomes a bit more obvious, hey, this is not a uh, internal software issue. This is a restart of the different layers there uh, for that. And eventually, you know, you can see it's a couple layers thick. The operator did come back uh, and took a look, make sure things were running, notice something was off. Uh, and then restarted it at the appropriate layer to then finish building that part. So there was a there was a temporary wrong restart that got caught quickly, but there was a wrong restart at layer zero, and that's basically what we're seeing here is is the false layer zero. Did that did that cause the part to become dysfunctional? The part, the internal channels that go through. Very critical. If those are blocked for any reason, then you can't get the flow and the part's not going to function. So we were very worried, depending on the height of where that plane went through, did it cut off those internal passageways or were we able to get through there? And so that's why we cut it at the end. The other big concern on this is if you are stopping at an intermediate layer and then restarting, does that now become a weak point in your structure, right? Because it can cool off, you restart, different microstructure. Uh, that builds up there in heat treatment. We got lucky in this regard in that it didn't, you know, didn't damage the structural integrity and didn't damage the functionality. The internal uh, passageways there remained open, uh, luckily, despite the, uh, despite the error that occurred. Part of the internal passages that were needed, uh, we see them here and, and, it, and this fail happened early enough that a drill could still reach through and open up where you needed to open up. So this is an example of an, an effect of a power interruption and, and an illustration of the, the hazard and difficulty that uh, interrupted power can bring to a laser powder bed fusion process you're in a better state now with regard to, with regard to uh, reliable power. And part of why you got that way relates to uh, a squirrel, right? Can you tell that story? <laughs> <laughs> it does. Well, first and foremost, if you don't have an uninterrupted power supply on some of your systems, you know, regardless of the stability of your electrical grid, it, it's probably well worth the investment. You know, they may cost twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000, depending on what you get. But you know, one or two failed builds at, you know, $20,000 each will immediately pay for that, right? So it, it pays for itself. But to your point, Bob uh, was not far off the mark there. We had earlier that year, it wasn't that build, but eventually a, a squirrel uh, did eat into the wires, uh, blew the transformer that was already uh, a bit shaky there. That is what had led to uh, some of the disruptions uh, in that particular build. But eventually a squirrel took it out. 
uh, and we got a new transformer in and uh, power has been running steady ever since. And then we've got the backup there if we need it. So funny what, uh, what nature can do to you sometimes. Yeah, so I want to I pause and draw a circle around that. Bob Markley, you were more correct with the squirrel theory. All right, so, so all that said, um, a whole lot of our respondents um, pointed to software and pointed to the problem of, of using STL uh, as the model format. And as it happens, there was a challenge with this part related to STL. And I think we can see that in the photo here. Describe what we're looking at. Absolutely. I think you can see the sort of the vertical lines on the outside there. It sort of looks, you know, tessellated, say. Well, that's because of uh, the STL file conversion. And so this lattice uh, and this part, you've got a very, you know, the outer diameter is about three inches. And then you've got small lattices inside that are, you know, maybe an eighth of an inch in diameter. And so when you approximate, uh, export this as an STL, the tessellation uh, sort of the accuracy and tolerances for the small struts versus the larger part, you, you can't change that. And so you either have to, uh, you know, get it very accurate for the smaller ones and, and then your bigger one blows up or vice versa. And so just some of the inherent limitations in the STL file format, in this case, we overcame those. We made sure our internal lattices were, uh, were, were approximated well we dealt with the external tessellation by having some machining allowances that then, you know, once we did, uh, you know, put it on a lathe and turned it a couple of times, you know, it was nice and smooth and we were good to go. But, but that remains an issue now. And it certainly frustrates, you know, designers, uh, engineers with their CAD models to have to take nice smooth curves and approximations and, you know, break them up into a bunch of triangles to then be able to 3D print it. Nobody wants that. Uh, STL was not the cause of this error. This error was because of power interruption, but STL ultimately is the reason why there's a smooth machine surface here. This part was machined on a lathe to deal with that modeling issue. Okay, so Tim, STL is kind of a standard way to, to deal with, with modeling related to additive manufacturing. Is it the only option? Are there alternatives? No, I think that's one of the, the interesting advances now is trying to avoid uh, having to go to STL altogether. We saw several responses from the team at Entopology. Uh, I think uh, hashtag death to STL there. You know, the nice thing of within their geometry, they're slicing directly uh, then to export it. So they're skipping that STL uh, conversion altogether. And then Bob Markley in his response had mentioned 3D Expert uh, with their direct metal printing, as they call it. They go directly from their CAD model slice it to then be able to print it and so we're you know we're now seeing advances in the software domain that allow us to sort of skip over that intermediate step uh given the the computing power and, and tools that are available to us these days all right thank you tim keep watching everyone what you want to do is follow the hashtag amwtf in linkedin we're going to share our next build fail there we're going to ask for your guesses and then tim you'll join me again to talk about what really happened absolutely and i know we've been picking on uh, powder bed fusion a lot lately so we'll switch over and talk uh, about some failures with directed energy deposition next time around so don't miss it oh awesome okay so ded gets its due coming soon Thank you to our sponsor, Verisurf, a measurement solutions company. Use Verisurf software as a common measurement platform across the enterprise for analysis of parts made through additive manufacturing and other operations. Capabilities include quality and inspection reporting, advanced surface analysis, and reverse engineering. Built on powerful CAD CAM, Verisurf employs digital model-based definition, open standards, universal compatibility with CMMs, and comparison of measurement data to nominal 3D CAD or STL files. Regardless of operation, 3D printing, machining, casting, or molding, Verisurf supports the process by verifying the part. Maintain the digital thread through design, engineering, manufacturing, and part validation. Learn more Verisurf.com.